Christmas, Jesus, only Jesus, who can make the blind to see, who holds the keys that set us free. He paid it all to bring us peace, Jesus, only Jesus, Holy King, Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore, I join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus, who can command the highest praise. Who has the name above all names? You stand alone, I stand amazed. Jesus, holy Jesus. Holy King, almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore, I join with them and bow. Jesus, only Jesus, holy you look at all my highest praise, your sins the angels of above all names, you stand alone and bow, I stand away, Jesus, only Jesus, holy you look at He told me he was only going to do that twice. <laughs> Did it three times. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad you're here. Thanks for, thanks for coming out. It's cold outside this morning. Man, where'd that come from? Hold somebody's hand. So Jesus one time said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Can I tell you what that really means? What that means is that there will never be a shutdown of the church. That's what that means, because wherever you are and wherever I am, there's the church. We are the, this is Sunday church, so welcome to Sunday church, but wherever we go this week, we're the church. So that's good news, because there are some problems in this world. There is some brokenness in this world. It's not just in Washington, D.C., there's brokenness everywhere, and we're going to talk about some of that brokenness this morning and what that problem is and how to solve it. So let's stand. We're going to have a prayer together, and then we're going to get on with our time of praise. Really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. Let's pray together. Merciful God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, the death, and the resurrection of your Son. Help us hear your word this day and obey it, that we may become instruments of your saving love through Christ our Lord, who is our everything. In his name we pray. Amen. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy
in my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy Oh 
Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus." Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Be seated as we take our offering. Who, O oh Lord, could save themselves, their own soul could heal. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deeper still. partake of the bread and the cup, might we be this morning more aware of our great need for your salvation. You who brought us out of the grave of sin and death. And so we offer our thanks that you loved us, loved us enough in that depraved state to give your son for us. And we are truly grateful for the bread as we share it together in this moment. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all that agree said, amen.
sins have forever been erased. By the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, we offer thanks for his sacrifice and our salvation from that death. In Jesus' name we pray, and all that agree said. Just as I am.
our song story this morning. Charlotte Elliott, a Victorian hymn writer, was born in the South London district of Clapham in 1789. Her grandfather was a famous evangelical preacher. Her family belonged to the evangelical wing of the Anglican Church. <clears throat> Elliot was a famous humorous poet during her youth, but at the age of 32, she suffered a serious illness that left her disabled and an invalid for the rest of her life. She was also very bitter. But her lifelong spiritual mentor, Cesar Milan, a Swiss minister and hymnologist, counseled her to replace her rage and inner conflict with peace and simple faith in God. From that day on, she turned her literary talents to writing hymns. Although sometimes depressed by her condition, she always felt renewed by the assurance of salvation, and she responded in her hymns. In 1834, she moved to Brighton and lived with her brother, the Reverend Henry Venn Elliott. One day, when everyone in her family had gone to a church bazaar to raise funds for a charity school, Elliot was left alone, confined by her sickness. Though depressed with feelings of uselessness and loneliness, she recalled the message, come to Christ just as you are, which she had received from her mentor during the darkest period of her soul. She then overcame her distress to write this hymn, Just As I Am, Without One Plea, O Lamb of God, I Come. In 1934, Billy Graham was so moved by the song, Just As I Am, that he responded at the end of the altar call and was converted. And it became a regular altar call in his crusades in the last half of the 20th century, it also became the title of his autobiography, Just As I Am, the autobiography of Billy Graham. And I believe that that title could be used for each and every one of us, Just As I Am, without one plea. Just a couple of years ago, a chorus was added to the song, which I believe has lent itself to be even more powerful um, than the song already was, written by Travis Cottrell. And so we'll continue singing both of those. Let's stand together. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to Thee whose blood can cleanse each spot.
rescue, I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I So once upon a time, there was a young woman named Scheherazade, who was daughter to an advisor to a powerful sultan who ruled an ancient Arabian kingdom. And the sultan had been betrayed by his wife and had become very bitter. And so he wanted to get back at her, but not just at her. He wanted to exact revenge on every woman he could. And so he established a monstrous tradition. Each morning he would take a new wife, and the next morning he would execute her. The kingdom suddenly became a very dangerous place for young women. So some families just moved away, others sent their daughters away to protect them. And the advisor met with his two daughters and said, I love you, I have to stay and fulfill my role as advisor to the Sultan, but you must leave. But the older of his two daughters, Scheherazade, refused. In fact, she told her father that she planned to become the Sultan's next bride. And he begged her not to, but she would not be dissuaded. And so the marriage was made, and her fate was sealed, or so they thought. Scheherazade asked the sultan for one last request. She said, I'd like to say goodbye to my sister. And so the sister was permitted into the palace, and they embraced, and then her sister had a request of her own. The sister said, I would like for Scheherazade to tell me one last story. Her stories are wonderful. And so the sultan agreed, and Shaharazad began telling this amazing story, this tale with lots of ups and downs and twists and turns. The tale went on all night long until just before dawn, when the story reached its climax, and Shaharazad stopped, leaving the sultan and her sister on the edge of their seats. And she said, I'll finish this story tonight. And so, to everybody's surprise, the sultan let her live another day. And that night, she finished that story and began another equally tantalizing story with lots of interesting characters and twists and turns. And at the climax of that story, right before dawn, she stopped again. And this went on night after night after night after night for a thousand nights and one more night until the sultan fell in love with her and renounced his injustice, and they lived happily ever after. Now, that's a great story. We love that story because of the way it ends, and we know that as the beginning of the Arabian Nights, or 1001 Arabian Nights. Um, Sinbad and his seven voyages, uh, Shaharazad told stories about Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, uh, about Aladdin and his lamp. Disney has made a ton of money of Scheherazade's stories, right? And we like them um, because it ends happily ever after. But at its heart, even though it's a story about the power of story, at its heart there's an acknowledgement there that something is wrong. There's, There's something definitely wrong in this. This is a messed up kingdom. Right? This is, there's something terribly wrong with the world. Scheherazade is only as safe as her next story is interesting. She's kind of like a preacher in that regard, you know? <laughs> right? right? The Sultan's rage at being betrayed has turned him into this murderous tyrant. There's nothing more dangerous than a little man with a lot of power. Uh, he's the ultimate toxic male. So there's this wrong that has to be dealt with in this story, and every story is like that. Every story has got a problem 
or a crisis or a curse or something that the characters have to overcome or deal with to survive, which is why I want us to get back to Luke chapter 5 this morning. That's where we've been for the last couple of weeks, and I want us to go there again. So if you've got your Bibles, open it up to Luke 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third gospel, chapter 5, or on your device, Luke chapter 5. Because Luke is going to tell us another story, and this one is about a guy that has a problem himself. The problem is that none of the people in the story can agree on what the problem is. And the problem this guy has is the same one you and I have, because we're living a story too, and every story's got a problem. So let's see about this one. Luke chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 17 of Luke chapter 5. One day, Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They'd come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. So we should start with just kind of making sure we understand the characters in this story. There are two groups and two individuals, the Pharisees and the four friends, Jesus and the man on the mat. And here's Jesus' teaching, of course. Uh, And Luke says that the power of the Lord to heal was with him. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was a British preacher from the 19th century, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived. He was called the Prince of Preachers and and just a really, really great uh, communicator. Uh, He did a sermon on this passage, and he said that the reason the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal is because of something we didn't read. In fact, it's the verse just before This story begins, verse 16, where it says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Spurgeon said that the lack of prayer in uh, a church is like locust eating away the strength of the church. The church isn't praying, the church is weak. If the church doesn't do much to impact its community or to change lives or to have a presence in its community, the problem is probably not it doesn't have enough ministries or programs or anything like that. It probably has something to do with the church's prayer life. But anyway, so here's Jesus. He's the, 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 the first character, the main character. And then Luke says the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were there. So who are these guys? Well, there were four, I'm going to call them denominations In ancient Judaism, you call them sects, S-E-C-T-S, or whatever else, but I I call them denominations in in ancient Judaism. There were the zealots, and the zealots were the radicals. And as as far as they were concerned, the problem was the Romans, and the solution to the problem was violent resistance. These guys were serious. You've heard of Masada, maybe? Masada was this mountaintop fortress, and... Uh, the Jews took it over from the Romans. About a, about a thousand Jewish soldiers took it over. And then the Romans counterattacked and, and put the, the fortress to siege. And the, it was under siege for a, a very long time. But instead of giving up, the Jews in the fortress of Masada committed suicide. Over 900 of them. Those were zealots. 
They were like the Navy SEALs of ancient Judaism. They were tough. And then there were the Sadducees, who were just the opposite. Uh, They came from the aristocratic, wealthy class. Most of the priests were, uh, all of the priests were Sadducees. They had kind of control of the temple. And as far as they were concerned, in in their view, losing power was the problem. And the way to solve that problem was to collaborate with the Romans. So the Zealots wanted to kill Romans, the Sadducees colluded with the Romans. And then there were the Essenes, which don't show up in the New Testament anywhere, but they were really super conservative. They thought the Pharisees were liberals. They were so conservative, they went off into the wilderness and lived a monastic lifestyle. In their view, um, contamination with culture was the problem, and so isolation was the solution. And then we come to the Pharisees who are in this story. And the word Pharisee means the separated ones. Uh, they, they wanted to apply the purity codes of the Old Testament that were for the priesthood to everybody else. They wanted everybody to live at home like you were a priest in the temple. Their, in their view, sin was the problem. And the solution was to separate yourself from all impurity by meticulously obeying this body of oral tradition that had been handed down, they thought, from Moses. You had the the written law of Moses, what we call much of the Old Testament. And then they, the Pharisees, had this oral tradition that had been handed down, and they thought you had to obey both. And, And then they had their lawyers or the scribes who were experts in this oral tradition. And if you had a question about something, whether it was right or wrong, the scribes had the answer. I, don't, I wouldn't say the answer was always right, but, but they knew it. So these guys were pretty tough. So what are they doing listening to Jesus? Well, probably they're there because he's become increasingly popular. He's drawn big crowds. Rumors of spectacular healings are taking place. A couple of weeks ago, in fact, there was some guy who showed up at the temple claiming he'd been healed of leprosy. So they're here to check Jesus out. They want to find out who he is. And apparently there's a lot of them there. Now, here's a new thought for me. I didn't realize that until I started going back over this story a couple of weeks ago, getting ready for this morning. I always thought that the house where Jesus was teaching was full of just regular people. But then the way Luke frames the story, it's like it, there's no regular people there. It's all Pharisees and their lawyers. It's all the religious leaders because he says they came from all the villages in Judea and Galilee and all the way from Jerusalem. So you got a house full of these religious leaders all crammed in there listening to Jesus and they're skeptical of Jesus. Just like you or I would be if somebody we'd never heard of started drawing big crowds and making bold claims and teaching things that were outside our tradition. We're tempted to get a little judgy about the Pharisees, and it's easy because they do a lot of dumb things, but is it possible we're more like them than we want to admit? One of the reasons the the four friends couldn't get their friend in to see Jesus is because the Pharisees were in the way. So let me just toss this out here, just wondering, is it worth pondering? Do we sometimes get in the way of people trying to see Jesus? I mean, there are, are ways we like to do things. There are traditions that, I mean, we know that they're not probably in here, but they're pretty important to us. We like how we do things, kind of things we hold sacred. I wonder if we ever get in the way. It just, I think it's worth thinking about. So that's the Pharisees. The third group is the four friends. And look, these are good guys. I mean, if you need friends, these are the kind of guys you want. Martin Luther King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And these guys are doing everything they can for their friend. Who knows, who knows how far they've had to come. And they're carrying this guy on this, on this mat, this stretcher, and they, br- they bring him up to this door. They're good guys, but I gotta tell you, I wouldn't have done it this way. If it, if I, if it had been me, and I'm trying to get my friend into the house, and I can't because there are all these people, 
I would have, I would have gone into the room and said, hey, I got a guy here who needs to see Jesus. Jesus needs to see him. Can you guys just make a little room? Maybe some of you guys move that way. And if you guys could fold those chairs up and step over this, five minutes is all we need. We'll be in and out of here like that. Just, can you guys just make some room? And they would have, and we would have brought our friend in. But that's not what these guys did. Apparently, they didn't talk to anybody. They just climbed up on the roof. And then they pulled their buddy up behind them. And then they cut a hole in the roof. And then look at verse 19. Look at this again. They lower him down right in front of Jesus. Do you know what I think? I think these guys were engineers. I mean, A, they didn't want to talk to anybody. B, one of them has got to be down on the ground looking in the window, yelling up to his buddies, need a six by three hole, five cubits from the west wall. Because they dropped him right down in front of Jesus. Amazing. The last character in the story, of course, is the man on the mat. He doesn't say a word. He has no lines. And when the, if this were a movie and the director said action, this guy wouldn't move a muscle. And he's paralyzed. Here's what that means. It means that he eats when somebody else feeds him, not when he's hungry. It means that he moves when somebody else moves him, not when he wants to. And if he's dirty, somebody else cleans him. Somebody else dresses him. Somebody else carries him. He is unable to do anything for himself, totally dependent on the mercy of others. And so here they are in the same story. Jesus, the Pharisees, the four friends, the man on the mat. And they all know there's a problem because every story has one. They just don't agree on what the problem is. The Pharisees think Jesus is the problem. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? What's he going to do? Where is he from? What's he going to say? The four friends think the crowd is the problem. And to the man on the mat, the problem is as plain as the itch on the nose that he can't scratch. And Jesus, what does he think the problem is? Well, what does he do first? Verse 20, he sees the faith of the four, and he says to the man on the mat, friend, your sins are forgiven. So apparently Jesus thinks unforgiven sin is the problem. Why is that the first thing he does? If you're the man on the mat, if you're lying there paralyzed, and Jesus says to you, friend, your sins are forgiven, you're like, thanks? Okay? Why does Jesus think the state of his soul is more critical than his physical condition? Why does he think that his sin is more limiting than his paralysis? So think about it this way. You're in a car wreck bad car wreck. Hemsey transports you to the Huntsville Hospital emergency room. There's a large gaping gash coming from your ear to your mouth right down your cheek. It's the most obvious injury. If it's not treated by a competent reconstructive surgeon, you're going to look like the Joker in the best Batman movie for the rest of your life. Might even get infected. This thing looks horrible. It hurts like crazy. It needs to be seen about, but the ER nurse isn't focused on the gash. All he's worried about is your pulse, because it's high, and your blood pressure, because it's low. And when he presses here, you cry out in pain. And then the doctor rushes in. And she looks at your vitals, and you think, finally, somebody's going to see about this gash, but she doesn't. Nobody in that ER is, is paying any attention to the gash. It's going to leave a scar. It hurts. It might get infected. Why aren't they paying attention to the gash? Well, because your blood pressure is high. And because your, your pulse is high and your blood pressure is low. And you have pain here. You're bleeding internally. And if they don't find that bleed and stop it, the only person who's going to care about that gash on your face is the funeral director. Now, in that moment, do you trust those medical professionals to correctly assess your condition 
and do what needs to be done in the order in which it needs to be done? Do you trust them to do what first needs to be done? See, that's the question this story wants to ask. Except in this case, Jesus is the doctor, sin is the injury, and you and I are the man on the mat. N.T. Wright said, part of the Christian story is that human beings have been so seriously damaged by evil that what they need is not simply better self-knowledge or better social conditions, but help, rescue from outside ourselves. Do Do you believe that? That sin is our biggest problem. Do you believe that? We do a prayer service every year. We solicit responses, and and you and I turn those in, and I read them every year, and they are moving and heartfelt and often heartbreaking. But do do you know what most of those prayer requests are about? They're about physical health, our own or the health of somebody else. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's everything right with that. We ought to pray for one another. The Bible talks about praying for the sick. That's the right thing to do. Maybe we are so convinced that God has taken care of the biggest problem, the sin that separates us from from him, that we can take these lesser problems like cancer and cardiac and aging problems to him. Maybe that's it. Or maybe, maybe we think our biggest problem has more to do with our bodies than our souls. The gospel, the good news about Jesus, the story of the Bible is that our biggest problem is not what happens to the body, but what's going on in the heart. We're separated from the holy God by our sin, and it took God becoming a human being, living a perfect life, dying on a cross, lying in a tomb, and defeating death to deal with it. That's how big this problem was and is. That's how urgent this problem was and is. And it's not just everybody else's problem. It's not, I mean, it's not just yours and mine. It's everybody's problem. Paul, we read this passage a minute ago. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Dr. King put it this way. We may have all come in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And that boat's sinking without Jesus. What goes on inside of us is more important than what's going on with these bodies, our souls more than our bodies. One of our councils met this past week to talk about how we help the community, the food that we provide and the education that we support and the financial assistance we render, and it's all awesome stuff. The gospel calls us to meet the physical needs of people, and I love the way we do that through prepare and respond or through our, our mower ministry or through Huntsville Inner City Learning Center, uh, or Jobs for Life, or First Stop, or all the, there's lots of things that we do to try and help people who are struggling physically and financially in, 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 in this world. But the concern that kept coming up in that meeting, and I'm really grateful for this, the concern that kept coming up was that if, if we take care of people's physical needs, we feed them at Thanksgiving, but we we don't address the spiritual needs, the biggest problem, are we really doing what we're called to do? You you can't be a church, you can't be a Christian and not be concerned about people's physical needs, but there's got to be more to it than that. Years ago, I have this friend named Mike, um, and Mike and I were uh, packing lunches for this local school uh, project that we had going on. It was the thing where we knew that if kids weren't in school, they were not going to get breakfast or lunch because most of the kids that we were trying to serve were on the free lunch and free breakfast program. They they were living in an extended stay hotel about less than a mile from our church building. And because they were an extended stay hotel, they were considered by social services to be precariously housed. That's how the government put it. And so we were providing lunches for them in the summer so they would have at least two good meals a day, breakfast and lunch. So Mike and I were sitting here packing these lunches And Mike is the kind of guy who loves the Lord. He does. I mean, he loves God passionately, and he really cares about people. But if you need somebody to say something with nuance and to be delicate with it, Mike is not your guy, okay? He's real blunt. He's real direct. Um, And so I'm going to tell you what he said, and it may give you a little bit of heartburn. 
I'm just telling you up front, okay? Fair warning, trigger warning. So we're packing lunches and Mike turns to me and he says, Jody, are we doing anything to tell these people about Jesus or are we just giving them food? And I said, Mike, as far as I know, we're just giving them food. And he said, okay, here's the thing. He said, well, if we don't tell them about Jesus, we're just fattening them up for hell. That, that kind of hit me hard and uncomfortable. But I think Mike had a point. Jesus asked the Pharisees, what's easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say take up your mat and walk? Well, in that moment, it was a lot easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's no way to verify the claim. But if you claim to be able to heal somebody's physical needs and the guy is lying there on the mat right in front of you and you know he can't move, you better be able to back it up. And Jesus did back that up. Here's the thing. The irony. These days, in, in our culture, it's more acceptable to say, take up your mat and walk, to address the physical needs than it is to say your sins are forgiven because the idea that our sin has separated us from God is offensive. You start telling people that they're sinners, that they're not good enough to have a relationship with God and they get pretty indignant pretty fast. And so the temptation for us, for all churches, is to just kind of be a nice nonprofit social service outfit made up of people who like to get together on Sundays and tell old stories and sing old songs like Just As I Am. But deep down, even people who don't believe in God know that something isn't right with the world. They know something is profoundly wrong with the world. There's a problem in this story that we're living, a crisis, some corruption, maybe even a curse. So you and I have got to keep on trying to meet the physical needs of people in this community, but we have to keep on telling this story, the good news of what God has done in Jesus. Even if we, like Scheherazade, have to tell it a thousand times and one more time before people believe it. Because if they don't get that story, they don't embrace that story and believe it, then none of it really matters. Can I tell you the best thing in this story? My favorite part in this story is where Jesus says to the Pharisees, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. My favorite part. My favorite part because I have lied, I have, I've laid awake at night in the dark remembering my sins. I have been hounded by the guilt of my sins. I have been aware of the stain and the shame and the ugly parts of my story. And so when I read that Jesus has power on earth to forgive sins, I rejoice because he has rescued me and he can rescue you. You don't have to live with that guilt. You don't have to live with that stain. You don't have to live with that story. He can set you free. He can release you from it. And he's the only one that can do it. He alone can rescue. Let's stand. Let's sing and praise him for that gift. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. Let us out of death, to you alone belongs the highest praise. You alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death, to you alone belongs the highest praise. today as we close as always a couple of reminders first of all if you are the parent of a one-year-old or younger 
Remember that next week there's a special class in our Milestone series right down the hallway in the middle uh, that Amy will be teaching. That's next Sunday, the 27th. Um, don't forget the summit continues. Four Wednesdays um, nights this month that we're sharing together in a time of food and discussion. And so we encourage you to be a part of that. But please, RSVP, just like last week I said that four times, RSVP, RSVP, so we'll know how much food to have. We do appreciate you doing that. And uh, you guys got a service project tonight, so go teens, all right? Wow. Excited bunch. Hey, really, thanks for being here. We hope you have a great day, and we're closing prayer. Please bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for having blessed us with this morning with, with an opportunity to worship. God, uh, it, it's great to praise you. It's an, it's an excellent and great opportunity, and we thank you for it. And we continue to praise you in this prayer. Uh, as Jody has spoken about this morning, God, we ask for your blessings in, uh, in, forgiving, us, in uh, for, forgiving us for our sin. You have done that. You've given your son, and we're so thankful for it. We ask that you would help us to see... Uh, that uh, that forgiveness uh, it, it is above all, that you would give us the courage to speak to others about what you've done for us, what you can do for them, um, what you're so willing to do. Uh, we ask that you would give us the, the courage to, to share your love with others. Um, God, I ask that you would bless us uh, as, as a group here, uh, that you would bless, bless us as we look to the future for, to see what you want from us. Bless us individually too, bless uh, the families here. Uh, you know there is suffering, suffering here. We ask that you would relieve those, uh, the, the people here who are suffering, whatever it is. Please rescue them. Uh, we're wholly dependent on you. Uh, you have many ways to, to solve our problems, but we know at, at, that fundamentally you're the one that, who can fix our problems. Um, thank you, God, again, for your son, for your love, for your grace. And we pray through him. Amen.